Hi everyone, my name is Sid. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about Jay Brewer from Prehistoric Pets and Reptile Zoo. If you've heard about him, you're either a part of the reptile community, you might have seen him appear in some big YouTubers videos, or you may have seen the number of viral tweets and TikToks concerned about his reptiles. And if you haven't heard about him at all, you will learn all about him in this video. So Prehistoric Pets is a pet store run by Jay in a Californian strip mall. When it first opened in 1988, it opened under the name of Country Pets. Originally, it sold the usual stuff that you would find at a pet store, like dogs, cats, and birds, as well as some reptiles. But then a few years later, it completely completely rebranded into prehistoric pets, only selling reptiles. To his close friends and family, that came as no surprise because he had always been more drawn to reptiles. When he grew older, he became a commercial fisherman, but his love for reptiles didn't go away. As a hobby, he bred and studied pythons, and then his wife convinced him to give up fishing altogether and purchase the pet store that came prehistoric pets. One thing that he wanted to do through the pet store because he was so passionate about reptiles he wanted to help change people's perception of them. The perception that he saw a lot of people had towards reptiles was that they were some scary thing that were out to kill them, and he found that he wasn't able to easily change the perception that adults had for snakes. He thought that children didn't know any better, so he hosted a lot of events that were geared towards children. He wanted to get in and, you know, help form the perception that children would have of reptiles early. He hosted things like Jurassic parties and interactive interactive educational events. It was a big success and more and more people came to the store to check out the reptiles. He then wanted to make a TV show out of his shop. He created his own 10 minute webisodes called Prehistoric Pets, The Reptile Zoo. The and he peddled that around to cable channels as an educational, entertaining reality show. He had his sights set on the Discovery Channel, but nothing ever came from it at that time. His YouTube channel continued to grow, however, and so did the amount of people coming into his store. Every year, he had tens of thousands of people coming through his doors. He was getting so much traffic that he expanded the store twice, buying up the neighboring shops. But it actually soon turned into a problem business-wise. Jay thought that it was great that people were coming to check out the reptiles, but that was all they were doing. They weren't there to buy anything. So since people were treating it like a zoo, in 2008, Jay started charging a $5 entry fee. But as you can imagine, people weren't all too happy about having to pay to get into what was supposed to be a pet store. So the next year in 2009, he created the Reptile Zoo. So basically Prehistoric Pets and the Reptile Zoo were two businesses under the same roof. There wasn't an entry fee for the Prehistoric Pets portion of the store, but if you wanted to go in further and check out the display reptiles, then you had to pay a $15 entry fee for an adult or a $10 fee for a child. A lot of people would consider that to be worth it because there's a lot to see there. And a big reason why people visit the zoo is because there are some pretty rare and unique reptiles there. And Jay realized the value of housing those kinds of animals there way back in 1990. Basically, that was when the US economy tanked and so did the sale of pets. So in order to boost revenue, he not only put an emphasis on rare and unique reptiles, but he also set out to create his own. He did this by breeding different kinds of python morphs together. A morph in the reptile world is considered to be something like albinism, maybe a snake has a different eye color, maybe it's got a slightly different pattern on it, maybe it's got like a stripe instead of its usual patterning. You know, traits that make them look slightly different from how they naturally appear. So he started breeding reticulated pythons together that both had some kind of unique morph, basically creating a one-of-a-kind python. And he was often the only place in the world to create certain combinations. This is 
the first ever albino titanium. This is the first ever too. This is a Sunfire. That's the first purple suit. This is the only place in the world that's ever produced these. And not only did the wow factor of these pythons bring in more customers, but they also brought in higher prices. The prices would range from a few hundred dollars to tens of thousands. In an interview that he did with the Orange County Register, he said that the shop produces 3,000 babies every year. So that is a lot of additional revenue. And he didn't stop with pythons. He also does a similar morph crisscrossing with iguanas. You can breed an albino to a red and get crimson. The blue iguana is missing the yellow pigment and that's why it's blue instead of green because it doesn't have any yellow in it. Now the one in the back is another albino but a different bloodline and this is a red. So you can actually get what you call a snow. But unfortunately, albino iguanas are pretty much blind. Most, oh, 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 look at him. He smells the banana, but his eyesight's so poor, he doesn't know what he's looking for. So there are some pretty unfortunate side effects of trying to get a cool color out of iguanas. But his interest in unique reptiles went further than just experimenting with morphs. He has a host of other reptiles with deformities or certain things that make them stand out. He's had a couple of two-headed rat snakes over the years. He's had pythons without any eyes. And Mr. Kipling, a monitor lizard from the Disney show Jesse. And one of the biggest draw cards to the zoo was Twinkie, a 20 22 foot long, 350 pound albino reticulated python. In 2012, she got the Guinness record for largest albino python in captivity, but it wasn't publicized until the 2014 edition. And getting that achievement was a big moment for Jay because he had always wanted a world record python in something. It's been my dream for 30 years to own a world record giant python of any kind, I didn't care if it was reticulated or Burmese. And Jay's audience was super invested in Twinkie as well. In 2009, when the Reptile Zoo was under construction and Twinkie didn't yet have a name, a contest was held to name her. There were over 500 submissions before the name Twinkie was decided on. After that, she continued to be featured on Jay's YouTube channel. She even got her own fan page that amassed 15,000 followers. She also became a meme that went viral all over the place. And then when Twinkie was 10 years old and likely as big as she was going to get, Jay decided he wanted to try and breed her. But he didn't make that decision because he wanted to get offspring from her like he had done with thousands of pythons before her. He did it in the hopes of improving her health. Basically, a couple years prior to trying to breed her, she had completely lost her appetite. She was only eating a small meal once every couple of months. It was also noticed that she was frequently going into a shedding cycle, which was a bit of a shock because she had stopped growing. She also stopped showing interest in her surroundings. So in an attempt to improve her health and reset her natural cycle, Jay decided the only option was to try and breed her. He believes that a snake only has one goal in its life and that is to reproduce. So he figured by letting her achieve that goal, it would help level things out. Because its main goal in life is to reproduce. So it's willing to risk all, take all. That's why when I go to take the eggs away, they're willing to fight me. At first he thought he had made the right decision because as soon as he introduced a male python to Twinkie, they immediately started to breed. After that, Twinkie's shedding returned to normal and she started to have a healthy eating schedule. But complications did start to appear. While I was researching for this video, I found that there were kind of two versions of what happened next. One version was posted to the Reptile Zoo blog. Back in the day, they had a blog where they would post updates about all sorts of things and one thing they posted about on the blog was this whole Twinkie breeding situation. But it wasn't Jay making these posts. Pretty much all of the posts were made by someone named Lauren. But the author on the post for Twinkie's breeding situation was listed as an administrator. But I'd say that was just a mistake and it was also Lauren who wrote that post. I do not think it was Jay who made that post though because things that were written in that post contradict things that he said in his YouTube video about Twinkie that he made. And yeah, that is the other version of events that I will get to shortly. So yeah, the version of events that were explained in the blog post was that three months after mating, Twinkie laid just one egg. Then she lost her appetite. So the whole breeding thing that Jay tried to do wasn't a success and he was back at square one. So in order to help her regain her appetite, they would take her out of her main enclosure and then take 
take her to a different enclosure out the back, which they called a feeding enclosure. The purpose of doing that was because she was getting so used to Jay and other people entering her enclosure, she no longer knew the difference between what was food entering her enclosure and what wasn't. So that could have been the reason why she just wasn't trying to eat anything. She didn't know if a rabbit was entering her enclosure or Jay was. So moving her into a different enclosure where they would only put food into it was basically a way to try and show her what food was again. And so she would know that whenever she was taken to that enclosure, she would know that there was only going to be food going into it. But that did not work. Remember how her shedding cycle and appetite normalized for a bit after her first breeding? Well, that's what they try and do again. But the attempt to recreate that scenario and breed her again failed. So they permanently took her out of her display enclosure and put her in her feeding enclosure. That didn't work and she died one month after her 11th birthday. Jay's version of events that he published to the Prehistoric Pets YouTube channel slightly differed from that one. The shedding and the eating issues were consistent, but the two accounts vary when Jay says that he bred Twinkie and she laid a clutch of eggs. We, we found our destiny and she what happened was we bred her, she laid her eggs. At that point we thought we were we're gonna be okay. But as we know, the blog post emphasized that she only laid one egg and that is how they knew there were problems with her. But Jay says she laid her eggs and the eggs that came as a result of them breeding her weren't the problem. But something else was the problem to do with her reproductive system and Jay talks about how the python egg laying process works. And inside the females, two set, they're usually three sets of eggs. There's an egg, eggs that are gonna be laid, there's eggs that are like half prepped, like they're about the size of ping pong or a little bit smaller than a ping pong ball, half the size of a ping pong ball, and then there's little tiny ones. So we knew that we had those ones in the middle to deal with. Hopefully this doesn't get too confusing, but Jay thinks that these ping pong sized eggs inside Twinkie were the issue. When he realizes that that could be the issue, he wants to try and get those ping pong sized eggs inside of her fertilized, then they can form into a actual fertilized egg and then she can lay those eggs, getting them out of her system, which he believes will solve the problem. So he tries to breed her for a third time. Much like the previous two times, it was unsuccessful. Then he noticed her health rapidly decline and then he called a vet, but by the time the vet arrived, she had already passed away. And he believes that the reason why she did ultimately die was because one of the ping pong sized eggs inside of her burst or she had cancer. Unfortunately, I believe what happened was is either one egg burst or she actually has cancer. Anyway, I am more inclined to believe what the blog post said about Twinkie's whole situation, specifically the part where the blog post says that she only laid one egg, opposed to Jay saying that she laid all of them and it was actually her backup eggs inside of her that killed her. It just seems like a very specific thing that the author of the blog post would make up. And it just makes sense that the author of the blog post would report on everything exactly how it happened because of course they're not guilty of doing anything whereas Jay may skew things in a certain way to try and cover his tracks because he was obviously the one who instigated the whole breeding situation around Twinkie. It would look pretty bad for him if he revealed that she laid one egg and he just left the rest of the eggs inside of her and did nothing about it. In a video he talked about what he does when a snake of his gets egg bound and it's literally pretty much doing nothing. We're gonna wait till tomorrow and then if she doesn't lay, really there's nothing you can do. You can take her to a vet, they can cut her open and it'll ruin her for life for laying eggs. And what I found is that in most cases, in 98% of the cases at least, they'll lay the eggs over the course of the year, we'll feed them, the eggs will work their way out one at a time. What happens is the eggs start to go bad and it gets kind of slimy. When they get slimy, they get end up slipping out. She ended up laying all the eggs and then she can go on and live a normal life and everything is great. So yeah, he just hopes that the eggs get pushed out as they eat. On Google, it says you should treat it as an emergency and if you leave it untreated, it can result in death. So if that blog post is to be believed and only one egg came out of her, then that was a big issue. In a blog post when they first bred her, they were expecting 40 to 70 eggs from Twinkie. So that is a massive number of eggs that were still stuck inside her. So yeah, let's swing back to why she never should have been bred to begin with, let alone to try and improve her health. 
even if she wasn't already sick, she still shouldn't have been bred, simply because of the fact of how overweight she was. There is a direct link between a python obesity and egg retention or egg binding. So she was forced to breed where the odds of a successful egg laying weren't in her favor at all. And the way that she got so big to the point where she was bound to have complications when it came to her laying eggs was because Jay power fed her. That is basically when somebody excessively feeds a python so that it just keeps growing. And that is a very intentional thing that he did to Twinkie and many of his other pythons. So, you know, it's a little bit intentional to get them that big by giving them, you know, something they probably wouldn't get in the wild. They don't get fed every day in the wild so Twinkie gets a consistent diet throughout the whole year. And if you're wondering how you can tell the difference between an obese python and one that isn't, just Google obese reticulated python and some of Jay's pythons will be at the top results. An obese reticulated python's tail will just drop off suddenly, whereas one that is just of a normal weight will slowly taper off. That's probably the easiest way to see if a python is overweight from the outside, but there's also a lot going on with an overweight python on the inside. They have a higher likelihood of developing heart disease and fatty liver disease, both of which can be fatal. They're also more prone to developing reproductive disorders like follicular stasis and egg binding, which is what we just went over with Twinkie. Oh, and follicular stasis is when an egg forms inside of a reptile without a shell. And I will just mention that some of Jay's obese pythons do lay perfectly fine clutches of eggs without any problems. That is totally possible, but of course there is the higher possibility of there being issues. And I mean, at the end of the day, one of the biggest issues is the fact that Jay doesn't treat it when it does happen. But yeah, other than that, deliberately making a python obese just overall ruins their quality of life. Reticulated pythons are incredibly athletic and agile pythons. In the wild, they like to hunt and climb trees. They wouldn't be able to do anything like that anyway in the kind of enclosures that Jay puts them in, which is a whole nother problem, but Jay can completely takes away their ability and their drive to do anything like that by making them obese. And he has responded to the claims that his pythons are obese. He's given a few reasons for why his snakes get so big or why we perceive his snakes as big. One reason which he has been transparent about is that he just wants to get a big snake, which is exactly what he did with Twinkie. Another reason is to give female snakes a food reserve when they go off food while breeding. And we're gonna feed her a lot, but we have a goal, a goal in mind. Let her get in the maximum weight to prepare for a big clutch of eggs. But he also thinks that we just perceive his snakes as obese because we're so used to seeing thin snakes in the wild and thin people in magazines. You know, there's always that guy out there that says, oh my gosh, that snake's a beast. So the idea that a snake is fat is really because you're thinking, you're looking at your magazine at home at girls or boys or guys and fitness magazine and you're thinking that the, 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 you're thinking that a snake's supposed to look like that. Well, that's what a snake looks like when it's fighting for its life and can't find any food. And of course, we, we're not snakes and they're not snakes. So anyways, another practice that Jay has been heavily criticized for is the way that he removes baby pythons from their eggs before they're ready. In the reptile breeding world, there's something done called egg cutting, which is to make an incision in an egg that's about to hatch. Usually the breeder will start making incisions in the eggs when one snake has naturally broken through its shell. After that, the breeder will usually go through and cut an incision in the rest of the eggs. It is a very common practice and it's usually encouraged if you're experienced to do so. Doing it actually ensures that there will be a higher percentage rate of survival. Some baby pythons are just too weak to break through the egg and will drown in the egg if they can't get out. So to prevent any deaths, a slit is cut into the egg so it can leave without any issues. But reputable breeders always strongly recommend to leave the snake inside the egg. Now one thing you don't want to do though is reach in and pull the babies out. You have to let them come out at their 
own rate. All you have to do to help them, if anything, is just cut a little slit or window into the egg. But what you see on Instagram and some of these YouTubers is they'll just pull the baby right out of the egg. You really don't want to do that. You need to let the baby come out on its own. But yeah, Jay does exactly what is advised not to do. Obviously, Jay is considered a reputable breeder by many, many people, and his opinion and expertise is valued by many, many people. But there are a lot more risks involved with the way that he does egg cutting. One issue is that the umbilical cord could get wrapped around the baby python as it twists and turns inside of the egg, trying to get away from whatever just pulled it out of its egg. And if it gets all tied up while it's submerged in the egg, then it would drown. Another issue is that it could flee the egg before it was ready because it was disturbed so extremely. Jay does his best to shove of the python back inside of the egg if he notices that the yolk isn't fully absorbed but of course there's still a massive risk there. He has responded to the concerns and he says that he cuts the eggs because he doesn't want them to drown but then he pulls them outside of the egg so that he can check if the umbilical cord is wrapped around them. We're gonna untangle that neck and boom. So if you ever wonder why I'm doing this there's one of the many reasons right here. Come on. Got to get its head over there. Bam! Now look at that. The umbilical cord has no knot in it. It's perfectly perfect. And now he can absorb all that yolk, all that nutrition, not bleed out. And, uh, and it's literally a world's first. But really, he's only pulling them out of the egg so that he can check what morph they are. He's said many, many things in his egg unboxing videos that would suggest that he's only checking them to see what morph they are. See what we got here. Looks like open, opening up real Pokemon cards. <laughs> I think it, I think we ought to open that one egg to see what's in there. Keep, of course, I'm keep opening, hoping something real special is in one of these eggs anyway. And when I say real special, everyone's real special, but sometimes just by craziness, we get like odd snakes that you just don't expect to ever see. And it's not as black as I was hoping because it's got platinum, but you know what? We're not done! We still got a chance! We might get some... We already see what we could have had, but it looks like we got a live version of it. Sometimes he'll even open up an egg, immediately see that it's not a cool color, and just move on from it without giving it the slightest bit of attention. When I thought he needed to pull them out so that he could check the umbilical cord. ...in existence, one of them. So let's see, maybe... He, you know what? We might get another one! Man, that snake is no question. It has and it's a world's first so oh look at this look at that oh, oh man look at that no look at this look at this you guys <laughs> So yeah, he's putting these babies' lives at risk simply because he wants to check what morph they are. And that is one of a number of things that he does that completely disregards how the reptile feels. And what I'm about to get into are the main concerns that I see across social media platforms about Jay's zoo. And let me just preface this by playing this clip from one of Jay's videos. And after they hatch, they'll stay in the area and protect their babies. So, man, it's just amazing that people think that reptiles have no feelings. I mean, look at this thing. You think this snake is suffering because I'm, I'm, it's, I'm petting it? Of course not. It's used to me. So, yeah, in that video, he's disagreeing with people who think that pythons have no feelings. Which is interesting because he treats them as if they have no feelings. The main issues that I've seen in viral tweets and TikToks is that Jay treats his reptiles as if they are some kind of prop for a video or social media post. He deliberately interacts with pythons that he knows are grumpy so he can get some kind of reaction out of them. The real mean one's the other one. <laughs> I purposely got in the, my cage with all my big mean ones. He piles massive snakes on top of each other for content to the point where they could seriously get injured. Thank you so much for all the amazing follows. I can't even understand how you guys are blown up. He'll also force alligators to drop out of their enclosures for content. Come on, you're ready. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh boy, here we go. No, 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 no. You sucker. So, the good news is I purposely did it because nobody was here. Oh, we want to, want to, want to, want to. Oh. 
and overall he'll just taunt his reptiles to try and get some kind of stress reaction out of them. Yeah. <laughs> These guys are fine, I've raised them all for babies, they'll be perfectly fine. Oh no! Oh no! So yeah, for somebody who considers reptiles to have feelings, he's pretty inconsiderate of them. Anyways, let's take a look at some of the things that people have said who have actually visited his store. On Yelp, there is a pretty significant number of one-star reviews, but there are also a whole bunch of positive reviews. There are a whole lot of people who love to visit Jay's zoo, just like there are millions of people who love to watch his videos. But the vast majority of people will just view the reptile spectacles as entertainment and don't notice the plethora of issues outlined in the one star reviews. One thing that I kept seeing repeated in the reviews was that the store smelt bad. And at first that wasn't too much of a red flag to me because I'm sure if you enclosed a zoo there would be some kind of smell trapped in there that wouldn't be pleasant to the average person. But the good thing about Yelp is that photos can be posted alongside a review. And photos were posted of dirty enclosures and bowls full of uneaten, rotting, dead mice. So I can definitely see why the smell of the store was something that a lot of people took note of. But something else that could be adding to the smell are the dead or dying animals. Also photographed were some reptiles on their very last legs if they weren't already dead. And there's a lot of reptiles with mouth issues pictured in the reviews. Even positive reviews inadvertently captured reptiles rubbing their noses against the glass. At first glance, one would assume that the reason why they're doing that is because they're trying to escape, and that is totally accurate. The enclosures are far too small for these reptiles. Jay has used the reasoning that snakes prefer smaller enclosures because it causes them less stress if they can just curl up in a tight space. So even though our enclosures, a lot of people think are small, it's actually a requirement in order for that snake to feel safe. Which is true to some extent, but there is no excuse for keeping lizards in such small enclosures, which is why they want to get out. But another reason why they rub their noses up against the glass is because they have mites. There are many complaints in the reviews and all over the internet that Jay's reptiles have mites. So it completely checks out that his reptiles may be rubbing their noses against the glass because they have mites. Also for anyone who's going to comment that the reptiles are for sale so they're not going to be staying in these small enclosures for very long, I will just say that these small enclosures are also used for the permanent reptiles in the zoo portion of the premises. So yeah, while some reptiles may eventually get freed by somebody purchasing them, many of these reptiles are sentenced to a lifetime in these tiny enclosures. Also, countless enclosures either have no water bowl or have empty water bowls. And I just randomly watched a video of somebody walking around prehistoric pets and I came across this. And I was totally shocked when I saw that because that is a blue tongue skink. And these lizards will often drop their tails when they are handled like that. So it amazes me that the workers were letting that happen. But yeah, at the end of the day, from what I've observed, Jay is very passionate about reptiles. But yeah, it seems like he has long lost interest in reptiles that come in their normal, natural form when a giant python or a cool looking python can get him so many more likes and views. And I've seen him mention reality TV when something noteworthy, I guess, happens at the zoo. Well, are we going for reality here? No, no, no. Okay. I thought we had a little reality series gonna happen. Sure. This is a grumpy snake. This is reality TV, baby. It's just very clear that that is now his main motivation for what he does. Oh, and I think he has finally locked in a reality TV show deal. I believe he's got a TV show coming out on Roku at some point. But yeah, we see pet shops like Petco get criticized all of the time all over the place. So I just think Jay's pet store and zoo should be held to the same standard. But yeah, that is pretty much everything for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next one.